Amen. Revelation chapter 3. So we're at the chapter, um, church number 6 in our Revelation um, series where we're looking at the, the letters that Jesus wrote to the seven churches. So we're almost through the seven churches. This is the, the second to the last church. Keep your place in Revelation chapter 3. We're looking at the church of Philadelphia this evening. So I'm going to use um, this sermon to kind of um, brush up on some end times things that we're going to be talking about in the next few weeks in the next Sunday evening sermons. We're going to be looking um, specifically um, at clues and milestones is what the sermon series is going to be called coming up in the next couple of weeks after we're done with this series. But tonight, there's a topic that comes up that I'm going to use to um, just do a Bible study with you and, and kind of brush up on what we believe about the rapture, what we believe about the Jews. These are things that we need to understand to properly understand end times prophecy according to the Bible. So tonight, specifically at the two pillars of the pre-tribulation rapture. There's two pillars that this, this doctrine stands upon, and the first pillar is that the elect in the Bible are the Jews, or the, the physical um, nation of Israel as it exists today. And the second pillar that this doctrine stands upon is this doctrine that we, as say believers, are not going to suffer tribulation. Okay, so we're going to look at those two things this evening. You say, what does that have to do um, with the Church of Philadelphia? Well, it goes right into um, these two topics. Let's get into it, and I'll point that out when we get there. But let's look at verse number 7 first um, in Revelation chapter 3, where the Bible says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These, sing, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man open it. So we see a pattern, obviously, in all these letters where Jesus brings up a specific um, title for himself, name for himself, description of himself. This, um, turn to Isaiah chapter 22. This description of Jesus is this, um, this reference to Jesus being um, a door or a gateway that only he can open and shut, that he has um, the key of David to. Look at Isaiah chapter 22, if you would, and look at verse number 22. I hope you have your fingers ready tonight. There's going to be a lot of um, going through the Bible and flipping through the Bible this evening. Look at Isaiah chapter 22 and verse number 22. So in Revelation it says, it is he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. And the Bible says in Isaiah 22, 22, and the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he, he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. Again, a, a reference to Jesus Christ being this door that, that no man can open and shut. Okay, Only Jesus can open and shut this door. Turn to John chapter 10. As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ calls himself the door itself in John chapter, um, John chapter 10. Go to John chapter 10 and look at verse number 9. So we see that there's this reference of Jesus being um, this, this key of David, meaning he is the line of David. The Messiah came from the line of King David. This was the promise that was given to David. Look at John chapter 10, and look at verse number 9, where Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. Now turn to John 14. So Jesus here says he is the door. All right, and if you go through the door of Jesus himself, it's like you will be saved. Jesus is using that as a reference of salvation. Now, I met a guy out soul winning last week, and before we um, got into the gospel, soul winning with this guy, he, he was just kind of, he was a super laid back guy, and he was saved. He was saved. He believed on Jesus and all this, but he just didn't think it was a big deal that a lot of the people in his house, including some of his own children, were Mormons, and were, I think some of them were Catholic, Catholic and Mormons. It was a mix of them. I ended up giving the gospel to um, one of his kids. But Jesus says, he's like, you know, I believe in, he, he was kind of like, I believe in Jesus, you know, and this is my belief, but, you know, he's just kind of really flippant about the other belief. But the problem that that guy needs to understand, and the reason that you not only need to be saved, but you need to actually learn the Bible, if you want it to actually benefit your children in that guy's case, John 14, 6. So we see that Jesus is, he has the key. He's the one that can open. He's the one that can shut. He calls himself the literal door in John 10. 
that if you go through that door, you will be saved. But then in John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's great. You see that on posters all over everywhere. You see that on telephone poles. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But guess what? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's the problem. Jesus is the door. He's the only door, though. And that is, look, that's a hard truth. And that's a hard truth that, you know, in a very nice way, I told this man. It's like, look, Jesus, I'm glad you're saved. I am glad that you are going to heaven. But he's the only door. He's the only door. You need to make sure that these kids know that he's the only door. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Everybody loves that statement. But no man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's only one door. Okay, Buddha's not a door. You know, Muhammad's not a door. John, you know, John Smith is not a door. These are all, you know, these all lead to destruction. Go back to Revelation chapter 3. So that's just a great, um, that was a great description of Jesus, talking about how he's the key, he's the only one that opens and shuts. And again in Revelation 8, he goes a bit more, and he says, I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. So the message to this church is overall a positive message, actually. And they're going through a difficult time, this church in Philadelphia. And it starts out, you know, showing the, the details of what they're going through in verse number 9. He says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not. And you're like, you know, that, that's a strange thing to say in the Bible. There's these people that say they're Jews and they're not. And Jesus says, I'm going to make them of the synagogue of Satan. But do lie. He's like, they're lying. They're saying they're Jews, but they're not Jews. It's like, what does this mean? Who are these people? And I will make them to come and to worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. So he's talking to the saved people in this church, and he's talking to them about these people that are, that are persecuting them, these people that are after them, that are they're hurting them. Okay, now the synagogue of Satan has come up once already in these letters. Go back to Revelation chapter 2. In verse number 9, I didn't really go too deep into it on purpose so we could talk about it this evening. We're going to look at who the synagogue of Satan is and who the elect are in the Bible, which is the first pillar of the pre-tribulation um, heresy in the Bible. Okay, look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 9, where Jesus is writing. He's writing the other, another letter to a different church. He says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which, again, say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So again, there's this group of people that are, that are causing, and, and that's a good uh, definition of tribulation right there too, is there's a group of people who are putting this church through tribulation. They're giving this church trouble. And they say that they're Jews and they're not. They're really the synagogue of Satan. You're like, that sounds mean. Well, Jesus said it. So in Acts, it's interesting. In Acts, all the tribulation. So when you look at it just from the actual letter that Jesus is writing to these churches at the time, it matches perfectly. Because in the book of Acts, there was only persecution by the Jews at the time. There was no Roman persecution in the book of Acts. And the Roman persecution is here. We have Roman persecution, Catholic persecution, all these types of things. It came later, but in the Bible and the New Testament, it was the Jews that were persecuting um, the Christians at that time. Now, let's look at who these people are that say they are Jews but are not. Go to Romans chapter 9. I need to now, you know, this is what people would call, um, I guess, the, the doctrine that I'm about to talk about. The, the official name for this doctrine is replacement theology, is what we need to look at. I really, one, one advantage that I had coming from a Lutheran background to a Baptist, you know, I was not saved as a Lutheran, I got saved, and then I started learning the Bible and reading the Bible. I didn't have a lot of prophecy garbage tattooed in me before I came to just reading the Bible as a saved person. Replacement theology is one of the easiest things to understand in the Bible. It is so clear in the Bible about this. Let's look at, look at it very quickly. Look at Romans chapter 9. I don't want to dwell on it too long. I really want to get to who the elect is 
in the Bible, but I want to talk about who these Jews that say that, you know, they say they're Jews, but they're not. What is the Bible talking about here? They're actually persecuting the Christian churches. Look at Romans chapter 9 and verse number 4. The Bible says, Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and whom concerning the flesh Christ came. Saying, out of this line, uh, out of this, this inherited line, this is where Jesus Christ came. Who is over all, God blessed forever, amen. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for, now we see some very familiar language here, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. What in the world? Here we see more of this. What are we talking about here? Neither, because they are the seed of Abraham, you know, coming out of the line, it's, 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 it's genealogy. Everyone's obsessed with this genealogy, and Paul is undoing this, is what he's doing. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. He's saying just because they're related to Abraham, just because they're in that physical seed, doesn't mean they're all children. Like, whoa. But in Isaac thy seed shall be called. Look at verse 8. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. The children of the promise are counted for the seed. This is the concept that we need to understand. This is the concept right here. It is not, it is not a promise according to the flesh that makes you Israel. That's what he's talking about in verse number 6 when he says, they're not all Israel which are of Israel. Paul is saying it's not a fleshly thing. It's not who your dad's dad's dad was. It's, it's a children of the promise. Then look down at verse number 30 for sake of time. Look at verse number 30. He says, What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness. Now, you've got to understand the cultural problems that they were having here. Think of the times. Here you had, you know, the children of Israel, and they had the book of the law, and they had all these traditions, and we understand that they fell into works righteousness. They had twisted. I mean, how could that have happened? Well, look at us today. Look at what's happened today. Look at the Christian churches today. 99%, I don't know if that's the right number, but a 90 plus percent of Christian churches today are teaching some form of works. We have done the same thing that the Israelites had done here. We had twisted God's word and turned it into works. But then the Gentiles, the gospel went out to them as well. This was appalling to the Jews because it just it created all these cultural problems that Paul was talking about a lot in the New Testament. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. So they didn't get it by what they did. They got it by what they believed. They got it. That's how you get saved. So the, the Gentiles got saved through faith. Of course, that's how everybody gets saved. Look at verse number 31. But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? He's saying, why not? Because they sought it not by faith. Now look, he's speaking in generalities here, okay? It's, this isn't saying that some Jews didn't get saved. Plenty of Jews got saved, and that's, that's recorded in the Bible. But overall, you know, the religious leadership and the leadership and the nation of Israel rejected Christ. That's what he's saying here. It doesn't mean that some Jews didn't get saved. He said, wherefore? He says, because... They had turned their religion into a religion of works. Look at verse 32. They sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. All that to say this, folks. Faith equals Israel. That is what Paul is explaining to us here. Works equals not. Look at verse, uh, go to Romans chapter 11. Go to Romans chapter 11. We go to a lot of Bible on this. Let me just uh, hammer it home a little bit more. Go to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, look at verse number 6. So to be Israel, to be the true, to be a Jew was a spiritual thing. It was not a physical thing is what Paul is saying. Look at Romans 11 verse number 6. The Bible says, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. If it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. This is a great soul winning verse. If you have somebody that just can't let go of works, you say, look, it's either, well, this is saying it's, it's either by works or it's by grace. It can't be a mixture of the two. That's what this is saying. What then? Verse 7. Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So talking about grace, he equates 
He equates the religion of grace, the religion of faith, the true gospel with this group of people called the election, which is, is the spiritual Israel. Okay, go to Galatians chapter 3. And, Gal and, and the works, the works in Romans 11, the people that believed in works had not obtained. They had not obtained. And go look at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, look at verse number 14. So here we see, you know, that Israel is a spiritual state, the true Israel. Okay, so we see back in Revelation chapter 3 that there was Jews that were saying that they were Jews, that they were not Jews. And it's because they were physical Jews, they did not believe on Jesus, and it's a spiritual situation. Look at Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit, here it is again, through faith. Okay, look at verse 15. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, Though it, be, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So he's talking about the promise of Abraham is completed. It is, it is given through Christ, through faith in Christ. Go back to Genesis 17. Actually, you just go back to Galatians 3, and I'll read for you Genesis chapter 17 and verse number 7. The Bible says there, he's talking about um, the, the covenant made with Abraham in Genesis 17, verse 7. He says, And I will establish a covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generations for an everlasting covenant. That's that covenant through Christ right there, that everlasting covenant. The only way it could be everlasting, if it was through Jesus Christ. Okay, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, those people that believe on Christ. Look at Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. And this really just like wraps it up really nicely, puts a bow on it right here. He says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Boy, I bet people didn't like hearing that. I bet people didn't like hearing that. If you were, if you were prideful about being a Jew, if you were prideful about being God's people just because of who you were related to, then you probably didn't like hearing Paul say these things. He says, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. He's not saying that these things don't exist. He's saying that everything, all that matters is being in Christ or not. And look what he says in verse 29. He says, and if ye be Christ's, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. He's telling these people that these Gentiles that have gotten saved are now Abraham's seed. They're not just like, you know, they, they've received the promises that Abraham has received. It must have just been like, ah! I mean, can you see why the Christian churches were getting persecuted with this type of message? If you didn't believe on Christ, but you just believed in the Jewish religion and all this. And look, this isn't to beat up on the Jews. This is just to say that it is a spiritual state. The Jews today need to be saved just as the Muslims need to be saved. They need to walk through the same door of John 14, 6. That's all that the Bible is saying here. You're not going to get yourself to heaven. You're not going to get any spiritual favor just because of who you were related to. That is what is going on here. So, it is a spiritual state, and it always was. And why this is important, turn to Matthew chapter 24. So we see that we are, we as believers in Christ, are Israel today. Because it is a spiritual state. If you're saved today, you are Israel. You're like, I don't want to be Israel. Well, you are, the Bible says. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. This is why it's important. Look at Matthew chapter 24. So the rapture is this time. Look, the rapture, the, the word the rapture never really comes up in the Bible. The Bible never says the rapture is this. But the Bible describes a time when Jesus will come and get his people. He will come down from the clouds and he will get the dead in Christ. Well, we'll read it. The dead in Christ will rise first and he will gather up his elect, the Bible says. So there's this big debate about Matthew 24 on who the elect are. Well, we've already seen that we are the spiritual Israel and that the elect is equated to that you know, condition of faith. Look down at Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is a great end times prophecy chapter from Jesus. Look at verse number 29. And the Bible says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, 
Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light? And the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So now if, we, if you believe that his, you know, the elect is the saved believers, this is a done deal. The, the rapture is after the tribulation. Jesus is coming back to get his saved believers after the tribulation of these days right here. It's very clear. But if the elect is, if this is just the Jews or it's talking about some other group of people, then it gets much more confusing. So let's look at now who the elect are in the Bible. Look at Romans chapter 8 in verse number 33. It's easy to understand now that we've flushed out those who say they are Jews but are not. It's easy to flush out who the elect are. Turn to Romans chapter 8 and verse number 33. Romans chapter 8, verse number 33. The Bible says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Talking about, you know, being justified by God and not by us. Equating that with God's elect. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 2. I'll read for you Titus chapter 1 and verse number 1. The Bible says in Titus 1, 1, while you turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, the Bible says, Paul a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect. Jesus, he, I mean, Jesus, Paul is saying, he's like, he's literally, he's literally talking about himself here. He's talking about himself saying that he has the faith of God's elect. He's talking about, you know, he has the faith of the gospel, meaning he's God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. You at 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse number 2. It says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, how? Through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. There's that, there's that, that, that Jesus Christ justifies you through his blood. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. E equating, you know, somebody that is saved through the blood of Jesus to the elect. And my favorite is Colossians chapter 3. We could read more. Um, there's, there's, there's a dozen or so uh, more in the New Testament. Look at Colossians chapter 3. In verse number 11, we just went through this in Colossians chapter 3, but look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 11. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 11. The Bible says in Colossians 3, 11, it says, Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, sounds familiar, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the God. Holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. So it talks about someone who is, who is in Christ being the elect of God. Look, the elect are those who are in Christ. Through what? Through faith. It is very clear in the Bible. There is no verse that says that the elect in the New Testament are people that are not saved. Okay? Or that it has anything to do with people according to who their relatives were or anything like that. Go back to Revelation chapter 3. Go back to Revelation chapter 3. So there's the first pillar right there. We've broken down the first pillar before we've even really talked about the rapture, but go back to Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 10. Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 10 kind of pops out to me all the time because this is when I first um, entered into my first Baptist church, this was the verse um, that people would use or, or uh, pastor would use to tell me that the, or one of the verses, one of the main verses that I remember that people would tell me to say the rapture is before the tribulation. Okay, that the rapture is before the tribulation. Look at Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 10. And it's funny if you just look at that they would use this one verse because the context, the context of the whole letter to the church of Philadelphia is that they are going through tribulation. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. So look at this verse, Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 10. Again, we don't, I don't want to miss the whole idea of the church of, Rev, of Philadelphia here. They're going through persecution. They're being persecuted by people that don't believe in Christ. Okay? Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. See, Christians aren't going to go through tribulation. This is the second pillar, and it's really the silliest one 
of the pre-tribulation rapture is this idea that Christians are not going to suffer tribulation. I mean, hello, have you read anything about Christianity throughout history? It's pretty much all tribulation. Okay, let's look at the rapture. Let's look at the rapture. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and then we'll go back to Matthew 24 and see what we can learn about this second pillar. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So like I said, you're not going to find a, a, a word in the Bible that says rapture. This is the rapture. But there's this concept of this event that is going to take place that is all over the Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, look at verse number 13. And the Bible says, But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So I mean, the context here is, is, is Paul is saying, look, he's like, don't be sad. Don't be sad for your brothers that have died. You know, so look, and this, this, I could say this to you. If you know saved people that have died, don't be sad. Don't be sad. Here's some hope for you. Because look, if people have died and they're, they're not saved, there's, there's no hope. You know, there's no hope for that. There's no hope for that situation. Um, that's, you know, what a bad deal that would be for to be at a funeral of somebody that wasn't saved. Okay, but look, that's why we do what we do at this church and try to share the gospel, to try to minimize those numbers. Look at verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. He's talking about people that have died before. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So he's saying these people are going to be resurrected. He's like these people, when Jesus comes back for the believers, these people are going, they're, they're coming up first. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So here, you know, I mean, here, I mean, this is a great, this is a great verse to give to um, a church that's being persecuted. You know, these people were being killed. They're being persecuted. It's like, hey, you know, don't be sad. Comfort one another with these words. Jesus is going to come back. Everyone's going to be, you know, he's going to grab the dead first. He's going to grab you. We're all going to go up together. Look, if you're alive when this happens, now turn to Matthew chapter 24. Now turn to Matthew chapter 24. Now we can get some context about when this happens from Matthew 24, and let's read those verses again. Now that we know who the elect are, now that we know what the rapture is, look at Matthew 24, and verse, let's start out with verse number 25. Verse number 25. Look at, uh, behold, I've told you before, Matthew 24, 25. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning come out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. There's also this idea that, um, you know, has been popularized in movies and books, and I confess that I've read most of the Left Behind books many, many years ago. But this idea that people are just going to, poof, they're just going to be gone. You know, we're going to have, you know, the, the book is like airplanes are crashing and all these things because people just disappeared, right? But look, the Bible is very clear. It says lightning coming out of the east into the west. Nobody's going to miss this. Okay, everybody is going to know what's going, what's going on here. So shall the coming of man be. And then it says in verse 28, it says, For whosoever the carcass is, there will be the eagles gathered together. And look at verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be dark, and the moon shall not give her light, and stars fall from heaven. We going to miss this? We miss the stars, the constellations falling, as I read for you this morning, and the moon. I mean, can you imagine? The sun goes dark. The moon stops giving light. The moon stops reflecting the sun. And the stars fall out of the sky. And then Jesus is, is seen from the east to the west as lightning. Is anybody going to miss this? Is this poof? What happened to everybody? No, this is an event right here. This is an event that is meant for everyone to see. But it happens after the tribulation of those days. Okay, we, as, as Christians, if, if we are Christians that are alive when that happens, we will have gone through tribulation at that point. And then we will be taken up. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. 
shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Why, why are they mourning? Can you imagine? Like, can you imagine if you heard the story about Jesus and you chose not to believe it and then you saw that? You're like, ooh, we're in trouble. We're in trouble here. It was real. It was real. Look at verse 31. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. This prophecy is also in Mark 13, Luke 21, a couple other places. But at the end of Mark 13, in verse number 37, um, the Bible says this. He says, it also blows away this idea that it's just the Jews. He says, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. He says, what I say unto you, I say unto all. He's talking to everybody. He's talking to everybody here. And look, the sun and moon are darkened. That's a huge milestone right there, when the sun and moon are darkened. And that, that right there, the sun and moon darkened and the stars falling from heaven, that is all over the Bible. So when you're reading the Bible and you see that, you know that there's a reference. And we'll look at a couple of those. That's a reference to the rapture. Turn to Revelation chapter 6. Let's look at another reference of that. Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Verse number 12. So we can pick this time out. We can pick this time out in the book of Revelation by this marker, this milestone of the sun and moon are darkened. Okay, look at verse number 12 of Revelation 6. And I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars fell from heaven unto the earth. Even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. This is exactly what we're seeing in, Mark, in Matthew chapter 24. We're seeing it here again in Revelation chapter 6. It's talking about this time before the rapture. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men, or I mean, sorry, after the rapture. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief kings and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and said unto the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the faith of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So the sun and the moon are darkened, and then immediately after that, we see that everyone's afraid. And everyone, but look, we're gone. We're out of here. Okay, now what they will say, what people who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture will say, well, look, we will not suffer tribulation. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. They'll use Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 10, and they'll use verses like 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, but they misunderstand the word tribulation. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So the sun and moon are darkened, Jesus gathers his elect together, and then the wrath comes right after that. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 9 says, For God had not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So see, we're not appointed to wrath. So Revelation chapter 6 talks about the great day of his wrath is come, but the Bible is saying in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 9 that we're not going to suffer wrath. Okay, But go back to Matthew chapter 13. Wrath and tribulation are not the same thing. That's the problem. That's the misunderstanding. That is the second pillar of the pre-tribulation misunderstanding, the pre-tribulation rapture misunderstanding. Look at Matthew chapter 13, and look at verse number 21. Here in Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 21, this is a great verse to circle in your Bible because this kind of defines what the word tribulation is. When we see the word tribulation all over the Bible, in Matthew 13, we see this time it is defined, it is, it is given, a, we, we're given a synonym for the word tribulation. Look at Matthew chapter 13 and verse 21. The Bible says, Yet he hath not rooted himself, but dureth for, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. So when you're persecuted or tribulation, when tribulation or persecution, when people are persecuting you, why? Because of your beliefs, because of God's word, you know, you know this guy's offended. But tribulation and persecution here are equated. So the definition, the difference between God's wrath and tribulation is, you know, look, it's trouble for the person. Wrath and tribulation are both trouble. The difference is who's doing the trouble. That's the difference. Look at Psalm chapter 18. Psalm chapter 18. Tribulation equals persecution. 
the wrath of God equals his wrath on unbelievers. Okay, look at Psalm chapter 18. Psalm chapter 18, and look at verse, let's see, go, go to verse number 3 of Psalm chapter 18. Here we see, in Psalm chapter 18, we see a prophecy of the rapture. We see a prophecy of God coming to um, get his people. And look, we also see tribulation before that. And it gives us very specific details here of who's doing that tribulation. So here we can get more evidence on what tribulation is. Look at verse number 3 of Psalm 18. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So I shall be saved from mine enemies. This guy is under attack and he's being persecuted by his enemies. Who are they? The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death presented, prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and, cry, and my cry came before him, even to, into his ears. And the earth shook and trembled. Here's that earthquake. And foundations of also the hills were moved and were shaken because he was wroth. There went up smoke out of his nostrils and fire of his mouth devours and coals were kindled by it. And he bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. So here we see kind of a parallel. Um, you know, this is a parallel to, to David's troubles he was going through there. and It's a parallel of end times prophecy, I believe, as well. And then you see in verse 13 and verse 14, you see God's wrath follow in Psalm chapter 18. It's really neat how that reflects exactly what we see in Revelation chapter 6, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. So wrath and tribulation are not the same thing. Right. Tribulation is just something that we are going to go through. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it. The Bible tells us over and over again. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now you turn to Acts 14. I'll read for you 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Bible guarantees that we will go through tribulation as Christians. Look, you, you as a Bible-believing Christian will go through some kind of tribulation in your life. I hate to break it to you. I hate to be the bearer of bad news this evening, but you will go through persecution. Look, if you're doing, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you are going to be persecuted for it. You are going to go through tribulation for it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, you're in Acts 14. The Bible says in verse 12, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. This is maybe why people don't live godly in Christ Jesus. Because persecution isn't fun. Persecution, tribulation, trouble, it's not something people look forward to. But the Bible says when you live godly in Christ Jesus, you will be persecuted for it. You will go through tribulation. Acts 14. Look at verse 22. The Bible says, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Look, the, the Bible here is saying that these people are going to go through tribulation just in the time of Acts. And you don't have to look too hard throughout history to know that Christians are persecuted. Christians go through hard times. Christians are martyred. Christians are killed. Christians are being killed today. You don't hear about that, but Christians are being killed all over the world all the time. So all that to say this, the rapture comes after the tribulation. It is very clear in the Bible that the rapture will come after the tribulation. Now let's, let's look at my theory of clues and milestones. There's things in the Bible that are clues to the end times. There's things in the Bible that are milestones to the end times. So you say, what is, the tri what is tribulation? Is that a clue or a milestone? Well, tribulation itself, go back to Matthew 24. Go back to Matthew 24. Tribulation itself is a clue. Okay, Going through tribulation more and more and more just means that you know, it's a clue. It means that people are just they're less accepting of the Word of God, as the Bible says, and that they're just going to persecute Christians more and more. It's just a sign that we're getting closer. It's a clue. However, look at verse 21 of Matthew 24. There is a milestone here because the Bible says... In Matthew 24, in verse 21, it says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor never shall be. Okay, the, the tribulation that we are talking about that happens before the rapture is a milestone. How do you know that? Because it's going to be worse than anything anyone has ever seen. As a matter of fact, it says in Matthew 24 that in, unless Jesus cut it short, no one would survive it. 
You could hear in the words of the psalmist in Psalm 18, he's begging God to just deliver him from it. He's like, deliver me. I'm not going to make it. And that's how bad it's going to be. And if you know, well, you know stories about the martyr's mirror that I've read to you before, look, it's been really, really bad in the past. Christians have been tortured, killed by the thousands, killed by the tens of thousands. And you can say it's going to be worse than it's ever been. That will be a milestone. That will be a milestone. And then verse 29 of Matthew 24 it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. So it's not the rapture. The rapture doesn't just come after any tribulation. It comes after the great tribulation. It comes after the worst tribulation that the world has ever seen. And if you know, I mean, the bar has been set pretty high so far. It's going to be bad. And guess what? We're not going to miss it. The tribulation itself, tribulation getting worse, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know, persecution getting worse and worse. You know, people being less and less receptive. These, look, these are things we should notice. If, if, we're, if we're going out and we're, you know, people are just super receptive to the gospel, and the next year they're less receptive, and the next year they're less receptive, and pretty soon Fresno just doesn't want to hear the gospel at all. Look, those are things we should notice because that's a clue. That's a clue. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse number 1. It says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of them own, of them own selves, covetous, boasters, proud blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those who are good. That's you, by the way, as you carry the word of God. They'll just despise the Bible. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. I mean, look, that, that, that's kind of America from my perspective. I mean, you go into, you go into a neighborhood that's, that's wealthy. This is why it's less receptive, because they're lovers of pleasure lo rather than lovers of God. They're just like, you know, I, I got my stuff. I got my cars. I'm comfortable. Leave me alone. They're not interested. But so, look, these are all clues right here. So it's getting harder and harder to give the gospel. Look, it's getting harder and harder, as it says in Daniel, to travel to and fro in this world, to go and send missionaries out um, in the world. We talked to Brother Stuckey. We had a Zoom call with Brother Stuckey and his family a few days ago. It was great to see them. I, I wish we could go visit them, but we can't. We can't go see them. We can't travel to and fro. So look, these things are getting worse and worse. We should notice this. These are clues. Okay? These are clues. But... The great tribulation we will not miss because it will be worse than anything that has ever happened throughout history. Even if you don't know anything about history, you're going to notice. Okay? So you say, what does it matter? You know, what does it matter when the rapture happens? Whether it happens after the tribulation or it happens before the tribulation, what does it matter? Go back to Matthew chapter 24. Go back to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. I'll tell you a couple why it matters. And look, I'm not mad at somebody or I know friends of mine who are saved that believe that the rapture is before the tribulation. This isn't something to, you know, separate um, yourself from a Christian brother over, in, in my opinion. Maybe some people would, but I mean, in my opinion, look, it's, it's just, it's a benefit to us to have things in the right order. It's a benefit for us. There's a reason God gave us this information. Okay, look at Matthew 24 and verse 4. And Jesus said, up at the beginning of the chapter, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. There's your first reason right there. So you're not deceived. Okay? For many shall come to my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look, when all this deception is going on, wouldn't you like to know what's happening? Wouldn't you like to be able to, I mean, isn't the world confusing enough? Unless, you know, if you just know what the Bible says, know when the clues are, and know what milestones to look for, you'll know when these things are happening. Right. It's right there. It's right there in the Bible. That's the whole point of the upcoming series. So when things start happening, we know. We can see it. And that's the point that Jesus is giving us here. He says, many and shall deceive many. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verse uh, number 1. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, 
that ye not, he's like, don't panic, is what he's about to say. He's like, that ye not be soon shaken in mind, or be tro troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. It's like, don't read this letter and think, oh man, Jesus is coming in five seconds. He's like, I'm not trying to freak you out here. He's like, just calm down. He's like, certain things have to happen first. Okay, he says, let no man deceive you. Sound familiar? He says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there become a falling away first. And look, that's a clue, right? That's a clue. People falling away. We just read it in 2 Timothy chapter 3. People not being receptive. People being, you know, disgusting, haters of God. You know, they don't want to hear the Bible, all this stuff. These are all clues that we're actually seeing today, by the way. Except they're coming a falling away first. Ah, but then, and the man of sin be revealed. The son of perdition. Now we have a milestone right here. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, and so that he sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Does that happen every day? Is that happening today? There's somebody sitting in the temple of God claiming to be God. Did I miss that on Fox News? Look, we're not going to miss this. This is a milestone right here. And this is where, this is where the tribulation comes from. This is where the tribulation comes from is from this man right here who opposeth and exalted himself verse 5 I'm sorry remember ye not that when I was with you I told you these things look there is going to become a man and we know and I don't want to give it all away but there's going to come a man that is going to claim to be God he's going to claim to be the Messiah he's going to sit in the temple of God and claim to be God and he is going to persecute and guess what we're not going to fall for it because we're going to be like, hey, we're not deceived. Why? Because the Bible. Because we know what the Bible says. And he's going to come after us, and he's going to kill us. And he's going to bring tribulation on this earth that has never been seen before. We will not miss this. However, if you think like, poof, why haven't I gone yet? You know, if you think that, you're going to miss a lot of things. You are not going to be ready. Go back to Revelation Chapter 3. Look, Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 4, let me, let me finish reading Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 6. He says, you should hear of wars and rumors of wars. Clues. Clues. There's wars all the time. There's rumors of wars all the time. See, you not, I mean, you can't be like, this is, this is baby Christian stuff, by the way. You see a war break out in Russia and everyone's like, end times. The world's ending. Gog and Magog. Like, this is a person that doesn't even know what page in the Bible that's in. It's just a clue. There's always wars, and there's always rumors of wars going on. But it's just going to get more and more frequent. It's clues. They're clues. They're things we should pay attention to. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There should be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. Pestilences. Well, coronavirus. The world. No, it's just a clue. We should pay attention. We should pay attention. All these are the end of the world. All these are the beginning of sorrows, it says. Then they shall be, deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my sake and then many shall be offended. Many Christians will be like, what in the world? I'm not supposed to go through this. Because they believe that there's just this secret rapture and Jesus is just going to come and just grab them just like that. Look, we're going through this, folks. We're going through this. And look what it says. They shall be offended. They shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Look. Jesus is telling this stuff. There's a terrible time coming, and Jesus is trying to warn his people so they can get it together. So they can be doing what they're supposed to be doing. They can be united. They can be together. They don't just freak out and just turn on each other and not know what's going on. They can at least be the ones that know what's happening. Look, they can be getting people saved during these times. The Bible says that in these types of times, we will do great exploits in these types of times. So look, the Antichrist is coming. He's going to issue in this tribulation that becomes the worst tribulation that has ever happened, and then the, the rapture comes. Jesus takes us out. But he takes us out just before he's wiped us all out. Just before. And then God, God turns his wrath on the people that are not saved, the people that turned on him. So that's the order of things. It's so clear in the Bible. You really have to just like 
just kind of let go of logic and let go of the words in the Bible in order to believe that God, Jesus is just going to come get us. We're not going to go through any of these things. It's after the tribulation. It's very clear. Go back to Revelation chapter 3. Let's finish up. I'm running out of time here. Revelation chapter 3. I just have one last thing to talk about the, 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 the church of Philadelphia. Revelation chapter 3. Look at verse number 11. I told you um, a couple letters ago that you're going to get a new name. You're going to get a new name. A couple people ask, well, when do, when do I get my name? How do I know what my name is? Look at verse number 11 of Revelation 3. The Bible says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold, fat, hold that fast which thou hast. Let no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh, will I make a pillar? We know that him that's saved. We're through that. Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God? And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is in New Jerusalem which will come down out of heaven from my God. We'll look at that in the next few weeks as well. And I will write upon him my new name. So you get your new, you have to wait till you get to heaven to get your new name. So you have, you got a new name when you were saved and you get to heaven, God will write it on you. That's when you find out your new name. So that's the church of Philadelphia. And the irony, the irony that that verse in the Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10 is used, just to end here, to prove a pre-tribulation rapture is that the church of Philadelphia was literally being persecuted. <laughs> they were literally going through tribulation from people that, you know, they were, they were Jews that they weren't Jews. You know, the synagogue of Satan. They were being persecuted by the Jews of the time. Okay? And again, we see that, you know, being a Jew, being of Israel is a spiritual state of being saved. That's what the Bible teaches. The Jews today, you say, what about Israel today? What about the Jews today? They need to accept and believe on Jesus Christ just like everybody else. It's the same thing. Okay, we should go out and we should get Jewish people saved. We should get Iranian people saved. We should get Muslims saved. We should get all, everybody saved. It's all the same salvation. It doesn't matter what genealogy you came from. That's the Church of Philadelphia. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.